Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of this academic year for the Latin American Anthropology Seminar. This is an online seminar hosted at CLACS, uh, University of London, for early career researchers. We are three conveners who jointly coordinate the seminar. I know a Montoya at CLACS, um, Jessica Sclare at Cambridge University, who unfortunately can't be with us today, and myself, Denise Roman, at the University of Aberdeen. Um, this seminar runs fortnightly on Thursdays at 5 p.m. UK time, but as I mentioned, this is uh, our last session of this academic year, and we will be back on October next term. Uh, and before I introduce our speaker, uh, I wanted to let you know that we are recording the presentation, but not the Q&A. So please turn on your microphones. Um, if you have a question, when, once we go uh, to the Q&A, you can either raise your hand by using the Zoom, the Zoom function, or alternatively, you can type the question in the chat box. And I'm gonna ask you to to turn on your cameras if you're able, if you're able to do so uh, during the, the Q&A. So um, I'm really happy to introduce today's speaker, Ulises Villafuerte from Dalhousie University, who will be presenting uh, his talk titled The Haitian Proletarian Wager, The Case of Asylum Seekers on the Tijuana Border, Baja California, Mexico. Ulises, you have around 45 minutes to present your talk. And uh, without further ado, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you to Denise, to Ainoa, uh, and to Jesse. Uh, and thank you to all of you that are here uh, today to listen what I have to say. Um, a little caveat before I start uh, reading my presentation. Uh, I modified a little bit uh, the title. Uh, so instead of what uh, Denis said, it's going to be uh, the subaltern gamble, uh, Haitian continental uh, migrations, right? So I modified the title, but the essence of the of the analysis is going to be there. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, start uh, reading. In mid 2016, uh, hundred, hundreds of Haitian citizens began a journey by land from South America to the Mexico-US border city of Tijuana, Baja California, intending to cross into the United States through a request of humanitarian asylum. To enter Mexico, Haitian migrants passed as Africans from Congo at the point of entry in uh, siglo XXI in Tapachula, Chiapas, near the Mexico-Guatemala border. By presenting themselves as Congolese, uh, Haitian reduced their chance to deportation of deportation and facilitated the journey to Mexico. In response, Mexico classified them as stateless, granting an exit permit valid for 21 days. The strategy of passing as Congolese showed communication, show, show communication, organization, and collective action, sophistication and manipulation of the categories of citizenship and race, and an active awareness of the dangers, obstacles, and risk of the continental route. My goal for this presentation is to address Haitian migration as a subaltern and working class recourse. With this contribution, my purpose is to rethink some assumptions of the immigration literature and propose an original conceptual approach. The concept of subaltern gamble thus intends to critique the interpretations of Haitian migrants or Haitian migration as an automatic response to humanitarian catastrophes. In readings of this kind, Haitians appear as a displaced population forced from external circumstances, narrowing the phenomenon to a humanitarian morality. With the notion of subaltern project, on the contrary, it is possible to situate Haitian migrants as a subaltern group conscripted to their historical circumstances, and at the same time, as modern subjects able to deploy their will in concrete projects. The base of the following reflection is my doctoral research project about Haitian migration in Tijuana. I conduct field work from June 2018 to April 2019. During this time, I interview Haitian migrants and Mexican representatives of shelters and religion centers during this time. 
Additionally, I conduct participant observation with three pro-migrant NGOs doing volunteer work with them as an instructor of Spanish class for Haitians and Africans. Meanwhile, the notion of Subalter Gamble's Gamble derives from Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks, particularly his notes on the subaltern and working classes. For Gramsci, the subalterns' cultural manifestations were an active and dynamic response to their material conditions and relations within capitalism. Since in capitalism, we found relations of exploitations and process of primitive accumulation, the mental and cultural expression of the subaltern classes cannot be virtuous. On the contrary, they reflect their position of subalternity. To develop my argument about Haitian migrations as subaltern projects, I will begin by explaining how the idea of subaltern gamble rests on three great Gramscian themes, the Souter question, the concept of subaltern classes and subalternity, and his notes about Pascal Wagner. Then, to continue my argument, I will address the arrival process of thousands of Haitians to Brazil and the motivations and resources that Haitians deploy to carry out these projects. Finally, in the last section, I will address some conclusions about Haitian international emigration as projects carry on with volition, intention, cunning, directionality, and organization. So the first uh, section is uh, a Gramscian concept. The Sauter question refers to Gramsci's approaches to the composition and relations of the Italian state and its population as one divide between a semi-feudal and rural South and a modernized and industrial North. The relationship between the two regions was like an internal colonialist relation where the urban industrial development of the North depended on the impoverishment, underdevelopment and crisis on the rural South. In this sense, the South was administered based on, sorry, based on coercive political systems, massacres, rural arbitrariness and exploitation. The immigration of landless rural masses from the South to the North was one expression of the Italian unbalanced composition. This relation provided Italian industry with labor and the Italian hegemonic classes justified it through racial explanations, framing Southerners as less civilized or barbaric. In contrast, Gramsci considered this immigration as morbid because it was caught between the interests of landowners and industrialists. In a quote that illustrates what I mean by morbid, what, what Gramsci meet, means by morbid, Gramsci wrote that, and this is a quote, one of the reasons of the complaints about the rural exodus is to be found in the interest of landowners who see wages go up because of the competition from rural industries and a way of life that is more legal, less exposed to the despotism and abuse which characterize everyday rural life. End of the quote. Aware of this structural unbalance in Italy between a nation legally unified and two regions socioeconomically divided, Gramsci took particular, a particular interest in studying the cultural and intellectual subaltern practice and expressions. Subaltern classes or groups are not hegemonic nor dominant, and therefore their history is tied to the projects of the dominant groups unified in political states. For example, in the Southern immigration, the peasant masses, masses occupied a subaltern position vis-a-vis -vis the ruling classes, both the industrialists and the landowners, groups that compete to exploit them as labor forces. Gramsci then became interested in the condition of the subaltern groups as part of his efforts to develop a collective consciousness, consciousness capable of organizing itself against the capitalist classes. In this sense, Gramsci's political project is to transform subalternity into a conscious direction. Thus, in notebook 25, note number two, called methodological criteria, Gramsci writes that, and this is a quote, the history of subaltern social groups is necessarily fragmented and episodic. In the historical activity of these groups, there is undoubtedly a tendency towards unification, albeit in provisional stages. But this tendency is continually interrupted by the initiative of dominant groups and therefore, can be demonstrated only if a historical cycle completes its course and culminates in success. So alter groups are always subject to the initiatives of the dominant groups, even when they rebel and rise up. Only permanent victory breaks the subordination, but not immediately. Every trace of autonomous initiative 
by subaltern groups should be then of inestimable, inestimable value to the integral historian. End of the quote. This Gramscian certainty about the tendency of subaltern groups to unify took the philosopher to explore the subaltern cultural formations, their ways of thinking and living, and their tastes and inclinations. In this sense, Gramsci elaborates on Pascal uh, Wager. Um, Pascal Wager appears only a few times in the prison notebooks, along with Balzac's, uh, Balzac's idea that the lottery is the opium of the people, the Napolitanian, the Napolitanian tendency to play the lottery, and the translatability of subaltern attitudes to philosophical sophistication. In his analysis of, of, of Pascual Gager, Quager, in favor of Christianity, the philosopher recognized the, resembles, the resemblances between religious belief and games, on, and games of chance, identifying a subaltern inclination to gamble, a rationalistic calculation within horizon of uncertainty. In other words, in contexts characterized by arbitrariness, such as Southern Italy, being, betting on the lottery implies a chance to get out of the subaltern condition by a stroke of luck. Both the Southern propensity to play the lottery and subaltern emigrations contain the aspirations of the subaltern classes. On, part on a particular rebelling note, in this regard, Gramsci reproduced an excerpt from Matilde Serao about the lottery. The lottery game, this is the quote, is painted as a great dream of happiness that the Napolitanian people repeat every week, living for six days in a growing invasive hope that spreads, leaves the confine of the real life. The dream where all the things that he is deprived of, a neat house, fresh and salubrious air, a beautiful warm sunbeam on the floor, a high white bed, a shiny chest on the drawers, macaroni and meat every day, and the little of wine, and the cradle for the baby, and the underwear for the wife, and the new hat for the husband. End of the quote. Sorry. By relating the concept of subaltern classes, the phenomenon of the Southern immigration and Gramsci's note of Pascal Wager, it is possible to build an interpretative framework capable of addressing Haitian continental migration. The notion of subaltern gamble thus expressed the relevance of the aspiration of the Haitian groups the investments that migrants risk in carrying out their projects, and the uncertain terrain in which both aspirations and projects must take shape. The arrivals of Haitians in Brazil is illustrative as it shows how the South American country first became a possible and desirable bet for thousands of Haitians. So the next section is going to be the continental immigration, um, particularly to Brazil. In the narrative produced by intellectuals about Haitian immigration in Brazil, the 2010 earthquake appears as an explanatory factor for the arrival of asylum seekers. Thus, Haitian immigration seems like an almost mechanical or instinctive reaction to external, external catastrophes. However, two pieces of information contradict this assumption. First, Haitians did not, did not emigrate immediately after January 2010, when the earthquake hit. Instead, they arrived by the end of 2011, almost two years after. Second, Haitian migrants were not only from areas hit by the disaster. For example, 30% of those initially identified in Brazil came from Dominican Republic, the neighboring country in the Hispaniola island. When reports gave, give weight to the earthquake as a factor, they highlight a forced migration and frame Haitians as vulnerable recipients of humanitarian protection. However, the reasons behind Haitian immigration to Brazil are multiple and have to do with the perception of Brazil as a country of opportunities. Among these reasons are the 2004 participation of Brazil in the UN participation and pacification process of Haiti, the MINUSTA, and the investment of Brazilian construction companies in Haiti. In this vein, Castro and Fernandez and Costa in a different uh, paper also point out that Haitians understood that the government of Lula da Silva had expressly authorized and request Haitian mig migrants. The earthquake then was not the factor that expelled thousands of Haitians toward the Brazilian borders. On the opposite, Haitians themselves were the ones who pushed the situation. In this bet, 
they took advantage of the narratives of a destroyed Haiti as the main argument in their favor to request asylum. Brazil identified, identified the first considerable flow of Haitians at the end of 2011 and the beginning of 2012. The recognition of Haitian migration appeared in local crisis scenarios, particularly in border, in border crossing cities such as Tabatinga in Amazonas or Brasilea in Acre. In those places exist a, a saturation and concentration of Haitians in overcrowd and unsanitary conditions, evidencing an unexpected situation and a lack of administrative and material resources to face such panorama. However, before this period between the January 2010 earthquake and the end of 2011, the flow of Haitians to Brazil was, was, was not very noticeable and has been characterized by some authors as timid, while others consider it a pioneer current. In January 2012, Brazil reacted to the flow of asylum seekers through Resolution 97. With this decision, with this decision Brazil authorized 1,200 humanitarian visas for Haitians distribute in monthly quotas of 100. Haitians had to carry out the procedures at the Brazilian embassy in Port-au-Prince, and Haitians had to carry out the procedures at the Brazilian embassy of Port-au-Prince. Resolution 97 intent to regularize those Haitians already in Brazil, achieve family reunification, stop the flow of unauthorized entries, and combat smugglers' networks. However, the number of Haitian applicants exceed Brazil's expectations, causing an extraordinary flow of visa applications in the consulate. Confront with the complication of, of obtaining the humanitarian visas, for example, long lines, incomplete application, processing costs, and waiting times, Haitians continue to migrate to Brazil without the required documentation in an accelerated way. Furthermore, some authors have had light how Haitian immigrants communicate with relatives and friends about the friendly reception that Brazilian authorities and its population uh, bring to them, thus helping establishing the project as a viable option for Haitians. Brazil's response follows a double logic of generosity and restriction. On the one hand, Brazil did not deport the 4,000 Haitians stationed on its border, but on the other, it did not offer them asylum or humanitarian refuge as the Haitian request. Instead, Haitians' humanitarian visas made up an ambiguous position between economic migrants and refugees. Simultaneously, Brazil sought to increase transit restrictions to South America, particularly in Peru and Ecuador. Ecuador was a critical place as a gateway for international immigration to continental America due to the free transit policy or universal citizenship. This continental entry point is also attractive to migrants from various African and East Asian countries intending to reach the United States. For its part, passing through Peru is part of uh, the Brazilian route as an obligatory transit place. Haitian informants interviewed during my fieldwork recall, recall covering Peru's route in one day, often hidden aboard cargo trucks in order to avoid immigration control and also assisted by smugglers' networks. Despite the determined strategies, the flow of applicants did not decrease but increase exponentially. Given the, insufficiently, the insufficiency of the quota system proposed by Resolution 97, Brazil renewed its position with Resolution 102 in April 2013. Brazil ratified with this new resolution the opportunity or moratorium to obtain visas, but eliminate the monthly quota system. Also, the migratory procedures sorry, were no longer limited uh, to the consulate of Port au Prince, but also to the Ecuadorian, Peruvian, and Dominican uh, consulates. For 2016, Brazil grant 67,000 resident visas approach to Haitians although the total number that enter will have exceed that number. With the regularization process, thousands of Haitians integrate themselves into productive activities in formal and informal niche. Despite the heterogeneity of the Haitian flow in terms of class, containing rural and urban folks, skilled and non-skilled, educated and not educated, 
the first current was mainly composed of men in productive age and enjoying good health. As Haitians migrants established the route, the profile diversified, including Haitian women, women migrating either alone or for family reunifications. The labor niche in which Haitians have integrated themselves in Brazil were construction, industries, and domestic services such as cleaning or landscaping, besides the informal and street sales market. According to Anjo Sampoli, the labor integration of Haitians did not meet expectation for many of the migrants, the migrants who hope to earn more wages, pay for family trips, or send remittance on a more continuous basis. As a result, a re-immigration process began when Haitians already regularized by Brazil start to seek new migratory and work destinations, for example, Chile and then the Mexico-US border. Through this review of the process of Haitian immigration to Brazil, we can see the key moments that open the possibility of Brazil as an attractive gamble. The resolution 97 and 102, the information shared about the minimal risk of deportation and the image of Brazil as an economic power were the reasons for the massive immigration of Haitian citizens. Significant was the image of Brazil as a great power. For example, one a Haitian informant I interviewed in Tijuana State explained to me that the humanitarian visa they gave him in Brazil, and I will quote, is an opportunity that, Bra that Brazil provides for us, for Haitians. When we arrived, when I arrived with my visa, they gave me my permanent resident, residence as a gift. End of the quote. Behind this objective understanding, we can notice how Haitian migration implies a dynamic of taking advantage of contingent moments open as critical opportunities. In this process, there is an intrinsic, an intrinsic degree of uncertainty and cunning. If we compare the arrival of Haitians in Tijuana with the process of coming to Brazil, it is possible to find some broad similarities about moments of contingency and opportunity. The presence of Haitians at the Mexico-US border was related on the one hand to the temporarily protected status, the TPS, offered by the United States after the 2010 earthquake, and also by different programs of family reunifications and humanitarian paroles applied to Haitian nationals already residents in the United States. But on the other hand, Haitians were also fearful that Donald Trump could win the presidential election and that he would dismantle all those benefits that Haitians have had during the last decade. After all, the Republican candidate based his presidential campaign on nativistic and xenophobic discourses, symbolically condensed in the idea of the need for a border wall protecting the nation from external menaces. Thus, what completely stopped the number of crossings and gradually the number of arrivals to Tijuana was the electoral triumph of Trump in January 2017. Simultaneously, the Haitian asylum seekers were discouraged when they knew about people that they know that were deported. According to one Baptist pastor of one shelter in Tijuana, and that's the original quote in Spanish, and this is uh, an open, uh, this is a quote, there was much despair those days to know that there would be a change of US president. They were very anxious and desperate. They want to cross. However, when the change came, Haitians knew that the US summarily deport many Haitians who cross. The US put them on a plane and deport about 300. Hence, they no longer wanted to cross. They had an opportunity to enter, but they say no, because they want to deport us. And we don't want to go to Haiti. Send us to another place, but not to Haiti. So they no longer wanted to cross. In other words, in the case of migration to Mexico's northern border, there was also a dynamic of conjunctures and contingencies and a relationship between open and closing moments of opportunity. To ground my analysis about the subalter gamble or bet, in the following section, I will address some of the motivation, resources, and projects of Haitian migrants from individual cases representing aspects of this migration process. So the next section is going to be some uh, individual case studies. Um, Wagner was the first Haitian I interviewed in Tijuana. 
He was a lay member of two Haitian Christian churches in Tijuana and worked in a maquiladora factory. During the interview, when I, when I asked him about his memories of Haiti, Wagner recalled, and all the names are seldom, uh, are not the real names, of course. So when I asked him about the, his impressions, his recallings of Haiti, uh, he said to me, uh, it is better, Haiti, because I lived very well when I was there. Because before my travel, I lived well. I worked in a school as a teacher. Sometimes I went to work in construction. Sometimes I went to work on landscaping. So it was good for me. End of the quote. Then I asked him why he decided to emigrate in 2014, to which he summarily replied, quote, it is my will to visit a lot of countries because I want to know, because I want to know about, about other nations. End of the quote. After that elusive answer, uh, Wagner delved a little more. He decided to emigrate with some friends. Quote, I have a friend living in the same place as me in Haiti. So when he said, I want to go to Brazil, I also wanted to go. End of the quote. With this explanation, I, I asked him, I asked if he knew of more friends or acquaintances who were going to Brazil, to which, to which he affirmative answered, uh, quote, my neighbor left from Haiti to Brazil and he achieved many things. For example, he built a big house and bought a car. That is why I thought there was a better life for me in Brazil. End of the quote. The sequence of responses in this interview gives an idea of the motivation of these migrants. On a first level, it was to visit another nation. On a second, to emigrate with others who were also thinking of living. And on a third level, to attempt to achieve what others were earning by living Brazil, by living Haiti, sorry. In Brazil, Wagner was working 14 of the 15 months that he lived in that country, in the cities of Cuiabá, Mato Grosso, and Caixas do Sul, Rio Grande, mainly in landscaping, working mainly in landscaping. However, after that time, he decided to re-emigrate to Chile and called it to him because Brazil suffered from an economic crisis. In Chile, uh, Wagner reunited with his wife, who made the trip from Haiti to join him, leaving behind the fears of their children, whom Wagner did not know because he immigrated first to Brazil. In Chile, Wagner and his wife lived and worked in Quilicura for about six months before embarking on a new journey, now heading to the United, to the Mexico-United States border. As he recounts, the decision to go to the border was similar to the one he made when he left Haiti. When she, his wife, was with me in Chile, there were many Haitian friends that I listened to, and they say, I'm going to the United States because there is a path that you can walk on foot, on foot by truck or by boat. So I decided to go because I also wanted to walk with them. End of the quote. The second case I want to mention is Morgan, a Haitian who was 32 years, years old when I interviewed him in Tijuana one afternoon outside a Christian church. This informant was born in Gonaive, in the Artibonite department, and is the firstborn son of his family. Morgan's father owns the land where he works in his hometown, while his mother runs a family restaurant. Morgan left Haiti for Brazil in 2011. Uh, where his, father, where his father expected him to begin a, a university education in Brazil. Morgan was one of the first Haitians to embark in this journey and therefore is a pioneer migrant. When I asked him about how he decided to emigrate to Brazil, Morgan unambiguously replied that he did not choose it, but instead his family entrusted him with the project. And this is the quote. It wasn't that difficult to decide. I was studying and then there came a moment when my dad said to me, hey, my son, I have to do something for you before I die. And I respond to him, dad, what are you talking about? You are not going to die soon and you haven't done anything for us yet. To which he said, the father, what I'm going to do for you is to send you to Brazil. I will sell everything I have for that goal. And I told him that there is nothing there in Brazil for me. They only have football, uh, football. Then he told to me, you have to go. And that's how I decide. That's how I decide with my dad because my mom didn't want me to go. End of the quote. Morgan stayed the following years in Portobello, Rondonia, 
until he embarked at the end of 2016 to the Mexico-US border. Also, one of the expectations of this migration uh, was for him to start a university career. He could not achieve that goal, and he remained most of his time working in a factory in Brazil. The last case I want to present is Conan, another Haitian immigrant that I met and interviewed in Tijuana. He exemplifies the relation between investment and migratory projects and trajectories. Conan, a man from a family of cultivators, owners of plots of land that they work themselves, was born in 1985-86 in, in Cape Haitien in the North Department. And at the time of the interview, he was unmarried with no children. Before immigrating internationally, he worked in Haiti doing construction work and as a factory worker. Thanks to the money he saved doing those jobs, in 2008, Conan paid for his first international trip to the Dominican Republic, where he settled in Moca, north of the island. From 2008 to 2014, Conan went to and from Haiti to the Dominican Republic, where he first entered illegally, although later he regularized his status. While undocumented, he worked in the construction industry for two years until 2010. After that period, Conan saved money to invest in a clothing sales business and regularized his immigration status in the Dominican Republic. To get the enterprise up, he started by putting up a small street, a street stall in ambulant markets, and eventually he set up a shop in his own, own home. However, according to his account, something happened in 2014 that makes him no longer want to be in the Dominican Republic. That is when Conan considered the possibility of traveling to Brazil, in his words. Uh, I put my business, quote, I put my business in the Dominican Republic, and then something happened and doesn't suit me. That's why I've left and I traveled to Brazil. And it was because I didn't, I didn't like something that happened in the Dominican Republic. And I am always looking for a country that suits me well, where I can do my, my business without fear. That is all I want because my dream is to start a business." End of the quote. While ignoring what happened to him, it is clear that he decides to seek new horizons in the face of complication in the Dominican Republic. Thus, Conan makes the trip uh, to Brazil, financed by his work in the Dominican Republic, and begins to work in the city of Cuiabá, Mato Grosso. He found work as a construction worker there and remained for the next eight months. After that first job, he was unemployed for the next five months before returning to work in the construction industry. Finally, he got a third job, employed as a helper in a local family business, a bakery. During his stay, during his stay of two years and five months in Brazil, Conan began a commercial investment in Haiti with the money he obtained in Brazil, collaborating with an associate who will supervise the enterprise. The business consisted of producing, distributing, and selling cleaning products. However, he recalls that the project fell apart because they could not comply with the regularization procedures in Haiti. Thus, they lost an investment of almost $4,000 spent on buying the required chemicals products and a motorcycle aimed to be used to distribute the products. To add insult to injury, Conan suffered the theft of the motorcycle. With the burden of this loss, he decides to invest in the journey towards the Mexico-US border, where he arrived in November 2016. When I interviewed him in Tijuana, he had a regular citizenship status in both Brazil and Mexico. Conan, Conan's case illustrates a relationship, a relationship between economic investments and migration projects, hand in hand with moments of opportunity and complications. On the one hand, he invests in going to the DR through his work in Haiti, but something happened to him and he decided to leave. On the other hand, with the money earned in Brazil, Conan invests his resources in Haiti, but once again, complications emerge that undermine his attempt to establish a family business, a small business. Finally, with the misfortune of a business failure, he reinvests in the journey to the United States having spent about $2,000 in payments to coyotes, to smugglers. Upon reaching the Mexican border with the United States, Conan realized that the crossing is not advisable because the US might deport him. 
Therefore, he decided to regularize his status in Mexico. Quote, I did not have papers, and I understood that Mexico would deport me if I didn't have documents. So I asked myself what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to where I was, to Brazil. Soon, I understood that Mexican immigration allows getting papers. And then I thought differently. So I went to immigration to start the process, and then I got a job. End of the quote. With these three ethnographic examples, I hope I have clarified a little bit what I mean by subaltern gamble. Uh, these cases indicate that Haitian immigration is a product of the evolution of the subjects directly involved in the process, responding also to the economic needs and material circumstances of kinship in Haiti. Uh, and in this last uh, section, I will conclude. And so, conclusions. Haitian international immigrations are gambles as Haitians invest in their projects, putting economic and social resources at stake towards an intended goal of labor integration. In this bet for the future, Haitians do not act as isolated individuals, but as members of family units, where the individual who departs lives as the bearer of the family investment and expectations, while leaving behind family as well as productive activities, property, and debts. If the gamble is successful, it must bear fruit and be expressed in an eventual circulation of remittances back to Haiti and in the formation of a chain of emigration where the resources earned are reinvest in new projects. Haitian projects are also subaltern immigrations, insofar these are not backed up by any state, although Haitian immigrants negotiate with several political entities. In other words, Haitians invest their resources in risky and uncertain scenarios. Without, without guarantees backing them up, there is always the latent possibility of deportation or dying en route. Therefore, Haitians emigrate at, 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 a, at a specific moment, sorry, and bet on nations perceived as good opportunities to balance their, cha their chances in uncertain context. That is, their emigrations are calculated investments. Furthermore, to, straight, to fortify their projects, Haitians cunningly negotiate with the state bureaucracy based on a humanitarian demand. The demand for a humanitarian reception is pushed with the aggregate arrival of considerable people at the border, at border points. In this dynamic, Haitians bet against nation states, borders, and populations. And the states react with punitive measures, for example, deportations, liminal states, for example, refugee camps, or legal regularization measures conductive to integrating them into the national workforces. In this way, the Haitian humanitarian demand involves, involves a level of negotiation where applicants more register their claim in the terms accepted by the nation states. At these moments, the Haitian gamble shows one of its most subaltern faces by subjecting themselves to the sovereignty of the nation states. Furthermore, to solidify their demand, Haitian asylum seekers must portray an image of Haiti as a country of chaos and national disorder. Haitian immigration to South America and then to the border of Mexico with the United States is a new version of a historical phenomenon where are combined the inability of the Haitian nation to employ its active population, the influence of hegemonic powers over Haiti, the advance of international mobility projects of labor integration, and the exploitation by other nations of the labor force that the Franco-Caribbean nation exports. With the notion of subaltern gamble, I argue it is possible to link some of these complexities, for example, the motivation for immigration, the investment that the emigrated classes make and risk, and the aspirations of what they will hope to achieve with their projects. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Ulises. 